Before we look at how a dryer works, we need to understand what happens to the water inside your wet clothes when they dry. Where does the water actually go? It's the same situation when water is left outside in a cup for a few days. Eventually, the water levels decrease. The water inside both the cup and the clothes seemingly disappear. In reality, the water turns to gas. But hang on a minute, didn't we learn that water boils at 100 degrees C and the hottest summer days rarely even reach 50 degrees? So unless you're living inside a kettle, I don't see how water left outside can turn to gas. Where is the water going? Welcome to Thinguide, the show where we learn the way things work. In this video, we're going to learn about the two ways to vaporize water and how dryers are engineered to speed up drying. We will also compare the different types of dryers so you know which one is best for your needs. And finally, we're going to discuss the history of dryer development. If you're not really interested in the science behind drying and you only want to know about the way the dryer works, please jump to the mechanical system chapter. For us to understand dryers, we need to know how they turn the water from inside the wet clothes into gas. Boiling and evaporation are the two processes that vaporize a liquid. Boiling occurs when the temperature of a liquid is raised to its boiling point. Increasing the temperature gives the molecules more energy. Eventually the molecules have enough energy to break free from the bonds that are holding them together. This occurs at 100 degrees Celsius for water at sea level. The temperature of the entire container rises so the particles begin to boil in bulk. All the molecules of water begin to break free from one another so the process is rapid. They transition from a liquid to a gas in all areas of the container, which can be seen by the formation of bubbles. The bubbles rise to the surface and the gas is released into the atmosphere. On the other hand, evaporation occurs at temperatures much lower than the boiling point. The temperature is made up of the average temperature of all the molecules. At any given time, some molecules are hotter and some are cooler. Evaporation occurs when one of the hotter molecules on the surface of the liquid has enough energy to break away from the molecules close to it, so it can escape into the air above. It only affects the molecules on the surface, because if one of the molecules deeper in the water has enough energy to break free, it will eventually collide with another molecule and lose its energy. Then it will regain its bonds so it's unable to escape. This explains why the rate of evaporation is much slower than that of boiling. It also explains why there's no bubbles, as there's no gas being formed in the depths of the container. An important point to note is that the bonds inside each water molecule stay intact. It's the bonds between the molecules that break. It would take an immense amount of energy to boil away all the water in your laundry, and it will likely cause damage to a lot of the clothing. This is why dryers rely on evaporation to dry the clothes. They reach a maximum of around 65 degrees, much lower than what is needed for boiling. The factors affecting evaporation are as follows. Temperature. With higher temperatures, more molecules have enough energy to break free from the bonds holding them in place. So more evaporation occurs. Humidity. The air around us is like a sponge, and a sponge can only absorb so much water. So the more gaseous water there is inside the air, the less space there is for new molecules to fit in. In fact, evaporation can stop entirely at maximum humidity. Airflow. The flow of air carries away the water vapour already inside the air, so there's more space for new molecules. The greater the speed of airflow, the quicker the vapour is removed, and therefore the rate of evaporation increases. Surface area. The greater the area of exposed water, the more chance it has for particles to evaporate. This is simply because there is more space over which the evaporation can occur. Dryers are engineered to maximise all of these factors to increase the speed that they can dry laundry. They increase the temperature and decrease the humidity at any point by blowing hot air over the clothes. The clothes are also rotated to increase the exposed surface area. There are two main systems to consider in a dryer. The first is a mechanical system of the drum rotation and the second is the air pathway. An electric motor is used to power the rotation of the drum. The motor spins a wheel which has a belt surrounding it. The belt is also stretched over the drum in tension so the rotation of the wheel causes a rotation in the drum. Spinning the drum makes the laundry tumble around inside, giving them the title tumble dryer. The drum also has fins on the inside. They're very useful to prevent the clothing from bunching together. 
This exposes every surface of the clothing to the hot air, preventing uneven drying. This is critical, as nobody wants to put on their clothes and realise there's an unfortunately placed wet spot. The drum can spin forwards and backwards to prevent the clothes from tangling. Counterweights, springs and hydraulic dampers are also used to eliminate excessive vibration caused by unbalanced loads. The motor is also used to spin a fan, which draws in air from the surroundings in a similar way to that which we discussed in the previous video on how vacuums work. Click on the card or the link below to see that video. This air passes over a heating device, either a flame for gas powered dryers, a heating element or a heat pump. We will discuss the differences in heating methods later. Once the air enters the drum, it follows a spiral pathway inside the dryer passing over the clothes. Once the air has passed over the laundry, it becomes saturated with moisture. It's no longer good for drying anything. So what do we do with it? Maybe if we had a room full of dryers, we could use all the hot, moist air to supply a sauna. Or maybe even steam some vegetables. Why not both? Well, nobody's made that a reality yet, so the moist air needs to be dealt with in a different way. This is where the different varieties of dryers come in. Vented dryers are the most common type around the world, and as the name suggests, vented dryers have ducts which carry the hot moist air to the outside. This is the least efficient method of dealing with the air, as none of the energy used to heat up the air is recovered, as all of the air is pumped out. Care needs to be taken to make sure that the ducts are cleaned yearly as small pieces of clothing called lint are picked up by the air. They can then deposit inside the vents, causing blockages which can decrease the efficiency over time as it's harder for the damp air to escape. This is also a leading cause of issues in the dryer. In ventless dryers, the damp air passes over a filter. This catches most of the lint. These filters need to be cleaned regularly. This is a very important step as these pieces of lint are highly flammable. So if they're allowed to build up inside the dryer, they can easily catch fire. In fact, dryers are involved in around 14,000 house fires each year in the US alone. So please make sure that you clean those vents and filters. There are two main types of ventless dryers. The first one is a condenser dryer. In this type of dryer, the hot damp air passes into a heat exchanger. This cools the air by transferring its heat to the surroundings. Cool air can't hold as much water vapour as hot air can, so when the air is cooled, the vapour condenses back into a liquid. The water is collected into a tank, which is then poured out into the sink after each load. Alternatively, the dryer can be hooked up to a waste pipe directly, to prevent the need of disposing. The air which has now been cooled and dried, passes back over the heating element and heated so it can be pumped into the drum so it can repeat the cycle. Heat pump dryers are similar to condensers, where hot air is cooled, but instead of using the air from the surroundings as a coolant, a liquid refrigerant is used. The energy from the damp air transfers into the coolant. The air cools down and the vapour condenses. The refrigerant, which is now hot, is then used to reheat the dry air minimising the wasted energy and massively increasing the efficiency. This means there is no need for a heating element, as the heat pump is used for both the cooling and the heating of the air. Heat pumps are a very interesting technology that have been slated to replace traditional heating systems in many homes. Now let's compare the three most common types of dryers. Vented dryers are very popular because they're cheap due to their simple tech, they also have large capacities for a given size as there's no need for components like a heat exchanger and a water tank. However, as we learned earlier, they're the least efficient type of dryer. You also have to be mindful of where they're placed inside the house as they need to be close to an outlet such as a window or a vent to the outside. Condenser dryers are more energy efficient than vented dryers as the air keeps some of its heat when it's reused, meaning they are cheaper to run. They have quick drying times and they are cheaper than heat pump dryers. These dryers can be placed anywhere inside your house as they don't need venting. However, they will warm up the room that they are in. Heat pump dryers are highly efficient and can use up to 5 times less power than vented dryers and 3 times less than condensers. 
They can be placed anywhere around the house and they can have slightly longer drying times than the others as heat pumps can take longer to heat up the air. They include a complicated system for the refrigerant cycle making them more expensive but the energy saving will be beneficial and you can redeem any extra money spent especially for heavy users. We can see that ventless dryers are useful for light users who are on a budget, for example couples who only use their dryer when it's not possible to air dry, as they will likely not redeem any costs from energy savings. Heat pump dryers are better for the opposite such as heavy users with large families and condensers fall somewhere in the middle. Although anyone who is conscious of the environment should prioritise the energy efficient heat pump dryers. Hybrid dryers have also started appearing on the market. They bridge the gap between condensers and heat pump dryers. They are essentially a heat pump dryer with the addition of a heating element. They are quicker to dry the clothes than a heat pump dryer but also slightly less efficient. Gas dryers are usually cheaper to run than electric dryers and they can dry the load quicker because they can get hotter. But they only make sense if you have access to gas piping close to the dryer location as installing new piping can be very costly. Washer dryers combine the function of both washing machines and dryers into one package. They can be very useful if there's limited space and will be cheaper than buying two separate machines. They also have the unique ability to wash and dry the laundry in one cycle without the need to switch the load between the machines. It's perfect for lazy people like me. However, washer dryers don't perform as well as two separate machines and the capacity is significantly smaller due to fitting all the tech into one package. Now we understand how the machines get the laundry dry, but how do they know when to stop? Over drying can damage clothing causing melting or colour drain and under drying will leave them soggy, so knowing when to stop is critical. The simplest form is using a timer, however this is not ideal as each load will take a different amount of time to dry, so using a set time is likely to result in incomplete drying or over drying which wastes energy. A thermostat can be placed on the exit of the drum to detect the temperature of the air that has passed over the laundry. This can give an idea of how dry the clothes are. The hot air transfers some of its energy to the clothes in order to speed up evaporation. This means that when the clothes are full of water the exiting air will be cool and as they get drier the air will heat up. When the air temperature reaches a certain threshold the sensors will send a signal to a control panel to inform it that the laundry is dry. In some dryers a thermistor can also be used to measure the temperature of the air being output by the drum. Thermistors are incredibly useful as they have the ability to automatically vary the power going to the heating system. So if the temperature being detected is ever too high the thermistor causes the power on the heaters to decrease. This is critical for safety to prevent overheating, damage to clothing and even fires. Another very clever way of measuring how wet the items are in the drum is a conductivity sensor. This works by having two exposed probes inside the drum. As wet pieces of clothing pass over them they touch the probes and the water inside the clothing acts as a conductor of electricity between the pieces of metal. This completes the circuit and the conductivity can then be measured. The more water there is in the clothing the greater the conductivity as the electricity will flow easier. When the clothes dry the conductivity drops and at a certain threshold the sensors will cause the machine to shut down and finish the cycle. Using the sensor setting instead of a timer will save power by effectively eliminating any over drying, which is better for the clothes, better for your wallet and better for the planet. Trying to decipher the settings on a dryer might seem like an impossible task but I'm here to make things easier. The thresholds for dryness used by sensors can be varied by the user depending on how dry they want the clothes. The levels of dryness that most dryers use are as follows. Iron dry leaves the laundry slightly damp to make ironing easier, although it's important to know that the ironing needs to be done as soon as the clothes are out the dryer to make the most out of this setting. Cupboard dry, this is used for clothing that will be stored after use. Extra dry is useful for large items like towels, bedsheets and duvets. This setting ensures that all the water is removed. The dryers also have different settings for the different types of clothing depending on their sensitivity to heating and tumbling. Here are some examples. Delicate or gentle cycles can be used in clothing with decoration or made from materials like silk or wool. This reduces the heat to prevent melting and has less rigorous tumbling. 
Air drying is a term used for drying with no heating. This is for clothes that are already dry but have been lying around for a while to give them back some of their lost volume. Perm press, much to my amazement, isn't a type of coffee. It refers to a cycle tailored for clothes that are prone to wrinkling such as synthetic fibres. It ensures lower heat levels are used and time for the clothing to cool down in the dryer reducing the need for ironing. Steam settings are used for clothing that haven't been or shouldn't be washed. It eliminates odour and removes wrinkles. Now let's look at the history of dryers. Drying clothes outside is extremely common even to this day. It's suitable for warm predictable climates without much rain. But if you live in a cold rainy country, you're out of luck. There was no real alternative until 1799 where a French inventor created a device he called a ventilator. It was a hand powered rotating drum which spun clothes over a fire to get them dry. With the major drawback that the clothes smelled of smoke and occasionally caught on fire. <laughs> However, his idea of placing clothing in a drum with holes over a heat source is the same basic design as that which we use today. An African American called George Sampson patented a device called a clothes dryer in 1892. He did what seems obvious now, which is to move the clothes away from an open fire to a less stinky and more safer stove. The clothes were placed on a rack to prevent them from coming into contact with the flame. James Ross Moore from icy cold North Dakota in America was sick and tired of having to wait ages for his clothes to dry. So he decided to convert his shed into a drying machine. He installed a stove and hung up his clothes. He realised that if he was having this problem of extremely long drying times in the winter, so must others. Over the next 30 years he set out to make the best drying machine he could. So his shed with the stove eventually turned into a rotating drum with both gas and electric models. Just like many inventors we've learnt about before, he had an ingenious product but no money to market and mass produce. After many rejections he eventually struck a deal with the Hamilton Manufacturing Company where they began selling the revolutionary new automatic drying machine called June Day in the year 1938. Dryers grew in popularity as well as complexity with the addition of sensors and computer chips. Now heat pumps and hybrids are the latest craze in dryer tech. There have even been some designs for dryers using ultrasonic technology which dry by vibrating the clothing very quickly. Who knows if they'll ever be successful. All in all we are very grateful for dryers and their inventors. I wouldn't want to imagine a world without them. Maybe you'll be the next addition to the dryer development story. How would you improve dryers? Let me know in the comments below and give me suggestions for what you'd like to see next. If you made it this far in the video you must have enjoyed it. It takes quite a lot of effort to make these videos and I really want more people to be able to see them. So I would really appreciate it if you could share the video with someone who you think might enjoy it. And finally, thank you very much for watching.